Hi, uh, this is Janet Fitch, and it is Writing Wednesday, and I am going to be answering some uh, viewer questions today, uh, writer questions, and one of them in particular uh, kind of grabbed me, so I thought I would start um, with a question from uh, uh, Davin, or Davin, um, if you're there, this one is your your question. Uh, it intrigued me because it is something that uh, every uh, novelist, every short story writer um, uh, searches for an answer for this, um, and it's about the music of language. Um, he says, an advisor suggested I spend some time trying to find the music for my novel. I know that other writers have discussed the importance of finding the rhythm for their sentences and how this serves as a driving force for the work. What are your thoughts on this? Do you have any tips for finding the music? Uh, yeah, your, uh, your informants are absolutely right. Um, every novel, uh, every good novel, has a certain sound, uh, like just like a meal has a certain flavor. Um, it's not that they make the meal and they add the flavor. Um, the food itself has a flavor, and anybody who has eaten flavorless food, which exists as well, um, knows that there is also flavorless writing. And uh, flavorless writing has um, there's nothing distinctive about it. Um, it was very interesting. My my own big turn as a writer came from getting a rejection years ago uh, from the Santa Monica Review, uh, which is still going strong. It's a, a great journal. Uh, but it was a rejection that said, um, good story, but what's unique about your sentences. It's like, what's unique about my sentences? What do they even mean? I mean, I was a history major. I had, I had no idea what that could possibly mean. But as I pondered it, and it took me, uh, you know, I have to admit it took me a while to even understand what the hell he was talking about, uh, probably weeks and weeks. Um, but what he meant was the language, there's a music in the language, in the sentence, when something is beautifully written, that um, was missing in my book. I, I, I wrote a very straightforward language, um, which itself can have a music, but I never, I didn't think much, uh, I didn't think at all about it. it. It didn't even occur to me that that was part of writing. Um, I was just story, 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 character, 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 and it didn't under, I didn't see that there was another level of, of craft um, that you could call finding the music. Um, now the, what I think of it is, I, I read all my stuff out loud, and if you do not read your stuff out loud, you need to start, because the ear can hear things that the eye can't see. And when you uh, read it out loud, you'll notice that you need an extra syllable to make the music. Um, it, I recommend reading poetry out loud. Uh, it doesn't have to be Longfellow or Wordsworth or somebody that you have no connection with. Read somebody you do have connection with, but somebody that has a voice, because what your instructor is telling you is that you need to find the voice of the book. That's what people mean by finding the music. You can also call it the voice. And voice is in the sentence, the way the sentences are set up. The um, number of, you can hear it, it's the number of syllables. It's, you don't have to count them, you have to hear them. And what I often do is ask people to read, I do it myself, read poetry before I write. I read it out loud. Um, if you haven't done this before, try doing it for 10 minutes a day. And I um, tend to, certain poets are very um, strong in the ear. So I recommend poets like uh, Dylan Thomas 
Anne Sexton, um, T.S. Eliot uh, has a very strong voice. Um, you can also hear them on YouTube or hear them, take out, you know, tapes of them, say, poets who read their work aloud very well. Uh, so you can hear the music if you can't find it yourself in the poem and then read it out loud to yourself uh, before you write. Now, it will affect your writing and the who, what poets you're listening to will affect your writing, but I don't care about too much about the agony of influence because if you're influenced by good people and you're gravitating towards their work, there is, you know, there is a natural influence and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Um, when I uh, teach this, I, I have students read um, Dylan Thomas, who is, you know, you cannot miss that music. Uh, the, I use the Ballad of the Long-Legged Bait because it's about 11 minutes to read it from uh, beginning to end. Uh, but listen to him read it first and you get a feel for it. Uh, what that does is bring the sensibility of music into your writing. And it can be very syncopated, very jazzy. Uh, if you read f favorite writers out loud or listen to them read, Elroy, uh, or James Elroy has a certain jazzy music, uh, very syncopated, very uh, snappy. Um, you know, almost all good writers have a certain kind of music. Um, uh, in their work, and it is inside the sentence. It's the way they construct a sentence. How long the sentence is, how short, how punchy, how do they put their s sentences together? And you need to start looking at how other people create that effect. Um, uh, read, say, Barbara Kingsolver's The Poisonwood Bible is in the voice of like six different people and each person has their own voice and start to look at how they make the music how do they how does each character put a sentence together really like take a paragraph and tear it to shreds tr see if you can um diagram it i can't diagram at all but i can try and it may it you start taking the sentence apart and seeing how they what is the music of that character? If it was a, a an instrument, what kind of instrument would it be? If it was a mode of transport, what kind of transport would it be? You know, is you know, and then you look at your book. So it doesn't necessarily mean the voice of the character. It means the voice of the book. Which, um, if it's in first person, then there'll be a, a lot of, you know, they'll be right on top of each other. But if it's third person. It's the authorial music that you're going to hear. And uh, this is what separates an ordinary novel from an extraordinary novel. Is that, and many people say they cannot write the book until they have the, the music. What is the voice of the novel? So I thought I would bring some examples of this. Um, I want you to listen to this. This is Kate Braverman, Squandering the Blue. She was my teacher and an incredible ear for this. You know, she was able to teach the music because that's what she was interested in. Um, and I want you to listen to this, um, listen to the, the syncopation, listen to the, the music of the language here. It was in the fifth month after of her sobriety. It was after the hospital. It was after the divorce. It was autumn. She had even stopped smoking. She was wearing pink aerobic pants, a pink t-shirt with kawaii written in lilac across the chest and tennis shoes. She had come from the gym. Her black hair was damp. Do you hear that? It's this driving thing, you know. It was, it was, it was. Uh, she's doing it on purpose. This is not amateur writing. This is all intentional writing. Um, uh, she was, so it's like, it was in the fifth month of her sobriety. Imagine 
the music behind it. You're at a beat reading at a coffee house. It was after the hospital. It was after the divorce. And this is kind of, uh, Didion does this too. There's a repetition in Didion. Uh, if you read plays, lays, take a look at that music. It was autumn. She had even stopped smoking. She was wearing pink. And then there's a list, pink aerobic pants, pink, hear the repetition, pink aerobic pants, pink t-shirt with lilac across the chest and tennis shoes. She had just come from the gym. Her black hair was damp. She was wearing a pink and a repetition, pink sweatband across the forehead. She was walking across a parking lot, bordered a city park in West Hollywood. which was carrying cookies for the AA meeting. She was in charge of bringing the food for the meeting. He fell into step with her. He was short, fat, so there is a staccato rhythm. And boy, when he starts talking, you get that too. Um, so there's not, you know, there's not long drifty lines. These are short staccato lines. And that's the voice of that story. Um, here is um, what music, you know, the kind of music that uh, is in this book, uh, The Last Bongo Sunset by Les Plesko, uh, who had been in the workshop with me, uh, that Kate Braverman workshop. And I, I just so admire this writing. Um, if you could ever read Les Plesko, um, I would do so. But let's see if um, the rhythm of this you can understand, you can see. I, I should have marked this. Um, I can't get my mind to shut up. Maybe right now Maria is thinking the John reminds her of one of her five fathers, the man in a pair of plaid slacks and a lime crew neck sweater, his hair greased with pomade, cheeks after shaves slapped. She might be eyeing the broken door handle, the unraveling fake leather steering wheel cover. They must park in the Super Suds laundromat alley. This is where everyone goes, I've been told. She may be smelling the breath of his nervous Kamchatka half pint, moist vented Clorox and Oxidol soap. That's very Les Plesko, that rhythm. Um, uh, there's a wonderful, um, uh, piece in here that I, uh, but anywhere you open it, there's that music. Cassandra looks leery. Gary is running his criminal hands through his greasy black hair. He has specific ideas on his mind. You know, it's, you know, the phosphorescent, the phosphoric filament stutter of streetlights flare and I long to go in. I don't do well in the dusk. It is a time of abandonment when premonitions lead to bad acts. So we're, um, the vocabulary become is more expansive, so you get a feel for the depth and education of the of the protagonist. Uh, we get multisyllabic words, so diction is a big part of voice. You know how uh, expansive is the diction? Is uh, you know how expansive will the diction be? High, how how high? How low? Um, you know, so that has a lot to do with the music as well. Um, some books have a long sentence feel, you know, um, I, in, in Chimes of a Lost Cathedral and generally in my work, uh, I love a, um, I love a long sentence, uh, and my character, it's a first person, but my, um, but my feel for the way language works I like the long, I like a long sentence. I like, um, I like the music of, of a long sentence and uh, um, the poetics of that. So here's, uh, she's riding the agitrain in Chimes of Lost Cathedral, my last book. 
Ah, to be mo it's called On the Red October. Ah, to be moving the wind in my face, the rumble of ridden thunder rocking me, shaking the dust from my feet, the speech of the giant wheels declaiming the miles, fire and steel hurtling me away from Tikhvin and all my compromises, Stiopas heartbreak, floors and brooms and kitchen. I felt like all the clocks in the world had started again. At a time when any ratchety milk train creaking and screeching its way back to Petrograd would have been enough to fill my heart 12 times over. This was the literary instructional train, Red October, a demon, a carnival, a smoke belching volcano of the modern. So it's lists, it's long, um, long sentences, lists, and there's a syllabic um, poetry in there, uh, you know. So you decide yourself what kind of language how long a sentence, all of this is sort of the temperament of your book. So you have to decide if you're going to be kind of a clipped, um, staccato, jazzy voice, say like Elroy or many other um, um, kind of tough crime uh, books uh, often are written that way. Cormac McCarthy, terse, you know, the sentences are uh, very the language is very rough and plain and uh, connected with ands um, instead of commas or periods. You know, certainly no semicolons in Cormac McCarthy. Uh, let's see what Faulkner does for us. He's one of my um, one of my favorites, and this is. Um, This is the music of Faulkner, and he's writing from the point of view of very simple people. But being Faulkner, they'll look for the long sentence and kind of a, an intense build. Um, the store in which the justice of the peace's court was sitting smelled of cheese. The boy, crowded, crouched on his nail keg at the back of the crowded room, knew he smelled cheese and more. From where he sat, he could see the rank shelves close packed with the solid, squat, dynamic shapes of tin cans whose labels his stomach read, not from the lettering, which meant nothing to his mind, but from the scarlet devils and silver curve of fish, this, the cheese, which he knew he smelled in the hermetic meat, the hermetic tells you were not in the character's head, right? Uh, diction. Um, which his intestines believed he smelled coming in intermittent gusts, momentary and brief between the other constant one, the smell and sense just of a little fear because mostly of despair and grief, the old fierce pull of blood. That's one sentence. One sentence. Okay, so there's the music of Faulkner. It's an insistent, it rolls. It's insistent, it rolls. It, it, he sees detail and there's no stumbling when you read it out loud, even with the long words, because he's very aware of the rhythms. So it can be short, it can be punchy, it can be long. It can be like Poe, which is a hesitation. He always tries to keep you away from the end of the sentence. So there's a lot of interjected, um, clauses to keep you away from the end of the sentence. Um, every, everything has a music. And so the more you're aware of this in your reading, the better it will be. And then look at your own prose. Take a, take a paragraph of that. Read it out loud after you've read the poetry and then see you See if you rewrite it for distinction. Make it, find some, something that feels right for that, uh, that paragraph that maybe you want to connect all the sentences. Maybe you want to break, have four, mostly four sentence, uh, four word sentences punched up by some long, a couple of long ones, but you know, do something with the sentence and listen to how it sounds. If you had to read it out loud, what are the words going to, um, are the words going to be pleasing? 
the actual one word up against another word, like in poetry, or are, um, you know, people um, just can skim it because there's nothing intrinsically interesting in the sentence itself. But poetry was the key. It was, was to me until I started reading poetry out loud and developing my ear. I, my prose was very flat and uninteresting and there was no voice yet. Um, so voice doesn't mean that you're writing in first person in the dialect of the person necessarily. Um, it means that there is a sound to it which means there's a shape to the sentences and uh, a control over the diction and the word length and the word choice and how you arrange your sentence. So here's another question. Um, I want to know what happened to Ingrid Magison. Well, Ingrid got out of jail and uh, she uh, is doing fine for herself. Um, let's see what... Here's some others. Um, okay, where's my list? Um, here we go. All right, I got a good batch of questions this time. Um, what is your daily writing practice? What keeps you making sacrifices to write? How do you get to a somewhat dormant project? So my regular daily practice is that I write and I just write every day, and uh, I don't do a lot of other things that people do. I generally don't have lunch, you know, go out and have lunch, you know. That's a very special deal if I do it. I stay home. I stay home. I don't do a lot of cleaning. I get up, I read for 90 minutes, and then I start working. And I work until usually um, lunchtime, eat lunch, go back to work for a few hours. Um, sometimes I work at night as well. So my writing practice is just that I do it. And that's what I do. And uh, I don't have, I'm sure a lot of you have more of a, an active life than I do. Um, I just work. Um, I know you don't write a... Uh, what keeps you making sacrifices to write is that I, this, I'm fortunate enough to do this, uh, but that comes with the responsibility that I need to do it to the best of my ability and really recognize whether I'm doing it to the best of my ability. I feel literally sick, like a vague nausea when some, when what I'm writing isn't going well when it's not at the best of my ability. I do not feel good. So I have to, I keep working until I feel good about it. Uh, so that drives me. I mean, I literally feel sick all the time, vaguely nauseous. Um, <laughs> is that something to recommend writing? <laughs> oh. How do you get into a somewhat dormant project? Um, I'm somebody who works on one thing at a time obsessively. So dormant projects will stay dormant until I'm working on them. And then once I'm working on them, then they're highly active. Um, and I'm super engaged with them at all times. Um, I know you don't write by outline. Lee, so that was Allison. Lee asks, I know you don't write by outline, but how do you ensure you incorporate key ideas, info you've amassed during your pre-writing prep work, uh, character development exercises, research, scene ideas? Now I have a vast spreadsheet of notes and need advice how to organize it. Do not organize it before you begin writing. Okay, this is really important. All of that research, all of that prep work, all of that stuff is like compost. You have to let it sit and decompose and become part of your mind. So rather, see, by making all this stuff before you started to write, you're already creating kind of a nightmare. You don't want to do a lot of prep before you start to write. You want to do that work as you're writing so it feeds what you're working on. But say that you did do a lot of stuff beforehand. Um, 
don't bother organizing it, that's stepping back again from writing. First you created all this stuff instead of writing, then you stepped away, and then you want to step away again to organize all the stuff that you did. But, you know, it's like, that. this is all ways of not writing. Now you start writing, and then you can, you, you, you remember, God, there was something that I found out about about this and then you can go through your notes I use Scrivener go through your notes uh, you know and say okay um, you know what was that oh yeah you know that that you know this was where I could put that story about you know Hector's grandmother um, but don't bother organizing that you know start in and then see what you need most of it should kind of be like compost inside you you, you carry that stuff around and you should be absorbing it rather than just, you know, you, you think you're going to put it together like a jigsaw puzzle and that's not how it works. It becomes part of you. It's in the deep unconscious, but you've done that work and it will make what you're doing more authoritative. And then if you need that work, then go, go find it, go dig it up, put it in notebooks. I'm a huge, huge fancier of notebooks print print everything out put it in a binder you know with divided into character research scene ideas just divide it in those throw it in there three hole punch and forget about it uh then when you need it you'll go through and it's like god what more could i say about this character i did all that work you know oh yeah um so three three ring binders uh, do not organize it to begin writing because uh, there's a million reasons why you shouldn't begin writing and organizing that is like washing the dishes in the, you know, rinsing the dishes that are in the covers. You know, you don't need to do it. All right, um, here's one. When you write on the computer, do you use Word or Scrivener or any writing software? Um, I use the last book I used Scrivener for the first draft and my research is in Scrivener because it's very easy to toggle back and forth but what happened was once I really needed to work on drafts of it I went into Word and I do my drafts in Word but I have my research in Scrivener and I'll go back to Scrivener and I can easily find pictures of Marina's dad or you know description of a peasant household or you know whatever it is you know what what's the order they plant oats first and then rye you know that is in my in Scrivener uh, very very useful um, here's a question really good question how from Terry uh, so that was from Alicia hi Alicia um, from Terry who asks how do I know how big my story is meaning short story or novel um, screenplay or short series on HBO yes I dream big but it doesn't but that doesn't make it work all the time how big the story is I usually start by um, writing I try to think small I try to write small first and then I can feel if it's like pushing at the walls uh, and then I have to ask myself do I want to spend five years of my life on this material? You know, it's pushing at the walls of a short story, but the next step is what, novella or novel? Or I can write another short story and see if that takes care of it. Uh, I'm very aware of not wanting to spend years on a project that I'm not like wholly, wholly, wholly invested in. I have to be really careful. Nobody wants to spend three years on a novel and then decide, you know, I don't really care about, I cared about this, about short story amount, I cared, but I didn't care a novel amount. So I think that would be one helpful thing is to um, ask yourself, how much of your life do you want to spend on that material? So start with a story and then ask those questions of yourself. I mean, a story might just satisfy it. Even a story might tell you, I don't even care about this. That was enough. Six pages, I'm out. You know, 18 pages, I'm out. 34 pages, I'm out. 40 pages, and there's still more coming. 
you know, do I end it there and then let it go? Or, you know, White Oleander was a 40-page short story. And uh, there was more there. I, I didn't think about writing it as a novel, but one of the rejections, of Joyce Carol Oates' rejection, said uh, that it seemed like the first chapter of a novel. So it just means like there's more. There, it doesn't feel done, it doesn't feel satisfied. Um, let's see. Whether it should be a screenplay or a short series versus a short story or novel, I don't know. You know, to me, a screenplay is a short story. So write it as a short story and then decide if you want to work on it, uh, uh, taking all the description out and all the thoughts and all the dis detail and everything and just having dialogue. You want to do that. You know, have at it. Um, a short series on HBO, that's kind of a novel. Um, I write fiction, so I always say write the novel, write the short story, and then, you know, you can make other forms out of it. But that's just me. Um, will I share that story with my white oleander fans? It was published in Black Clock uh, Journal in out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And uh, if you can find an old copy, uh, it's there. If I ever do a short story collection, uh, it'll be in there. Um, let's see. Here's one. Ariel asks, what are your thoughts on honing your craft and putting yourself out there via short story versus diving into a novel? Uh, for instance, if you are a tired new mom with limited time for creative work, is it better to spend that time focused on shorts, something you'll be able to finish and submit, or on longer, more daunting project that itches the most? Well, I would say short story, short story, short story. You know, until it is pressing at the walls. Um, new mom, I was writing before my daughter was born, and then I returned to my writer's group three weeks after she was born. I was terrified to stop. I did not stop writing when I had the baby. I was writing short stories. Um, the novel, I would say if you had already started the novel before your baby was born, you know, yes, just you just continue. But if you had not started the novel, I would say write some short stories uh, and, uh, you know, get them complete. And then notice if some, some of them are pressing you um, uh, to be long form. Uh, it'll be a natural progression. Um, get the baby swing with the D batteries. Uh, it's good for 45 minutes uh, of uninterrupted writing time. Um, I have a piece on my website uh, called Writing Tips for Parents uh, that might help you a lot. Uh, <laughs> so here's another question, um, Joe Beth. Um, I can't be there today, would love advice on what makes readers care deeply about your characters. I think what makes people care about characters is um, seeing their own problems reflected there. Um, even if a person is not um, quote unquote all that likable, if they suffer for the, for the same things that somebody is also suffering with, um, it keeps them caring, it keeps them interested. Um, caring, there's two, there's two ways of interpreting the question, because caring about a character, does that mean we care about them as, you know, as a suffering human being, as a person? Or do we just care about them as being a really interesting character that is um, fascinating and we just want to, we care about our experience watching them. Um, if they're interesting and 
unpredictable and uh, uh, charismatic, even if we, you know, we don't really care about them anymore. We care about them if they were people we knew. Um, we can't stop watching them. We, we can't stop reading about them. We're interested. But how do you make people care about a character? Uh, is the same way we people care about real people. We see the flaws. We see, we understand their conflicts. We understand, um, you know, we understand their hopes and their fears, and uh, we can identify with them on some level, even if they're very different from us. We can reckon, you know, we we read about a day, you know, a day laborer and. Uh, in Chile, and yet we've worried about money, we've worried about our family, we've had difficult jobs. Um, you know, we're all human. I don't think it's that hard to care about characters. Uh, it's hard, it's hardest to care about privileged characters because they often have problems that just don't seem all that uh, problematic uh, to most of us. Uh, it's very difficult. Often, our caring about privileged characters has to do with with family problems um, that everybody can identify with, even if somebody is uh, um, wildly overprivileged. And we all know what insecurity feels like. Um, bullying in the family, you know, what that feels like. There's a wonderful poet, James Merrill, whose father was Merrill of Merrill Lynch. Um, <clears throat> and you read his poetry, he's, you know, he's, uh, you care very much about him because he has a calm, observant, unself-pitying <clears throat> gentleness and woundedness that is, um, it's, that is very, um, um, appealing is a wonderful poet he's there are certain poets that I see as middle of the night poets you know the people who you read when everything is very quiet everybody else is asleep you can't sleep you they're very companionable you open them and James Merrill is somebody who feels like a friend that somebody who <coughs> can be up in the middle of the night with you so um, if there's no uh, last-minute questions I'm happy to answer, um, happy to take one more question. Here's one. Um, do you believe writing by hand is the same as writing on the computer? I think that every way you can write um, is a way in. So I'm a big computer writer. I have the worst handwriting known to man, but when I'm stuck, when I'm doing a character study, when I'm doing an exercise, I never do it on the computer. I always do it by hand. And there's something about the, almost something about the illegibility of it that uh, frees me up because I'm not looking at the product. I'm feeling it. I'm letting it come through and uh, I'm less judgmental. So there is a difference to me and for everyone. Some people all write the first draft in longhand and then write the next draft typewritten, you know, on computer. There's a million ways. Some people write with the screen turned off. So again, they don't see what they're writing. They just let it come through. That's a, that's a really good, what am I writing? I'm writing a short story right now, a noir story. And I have, it, it's like supposed to be 6,000 words and it's like, it was like 11,000 words and I cut it to like 10,000 words and then it's like I was having real trouble getting rid of the last <laughs> it's like I'm cutting it by half and I asked for help you know I asked for help I tried it with use two voices back and forth and realized that if I cut one I could really eliminate a lot of material but because I did it and we talked about this is when we talk about writer's block if you're stuck by seeing the problem 
or the situation through another character's eyes, writing it from another character's eyes. You get material that you don't necessarily have when you're writing it all from one point of view. Or you can try third person rather than first. You get information that you, if you're writing in first, try it in third. You get information that you didn't have before. So I tried it in two, two characters and then realized I would save a lot of room if I cut the second one, but I was able to use information and dialogue that I got when I was writing the second character. So writing a noir story, it's due on Friday, and I think I can do it. And so I want to thank you for watching Writing Wednesday, and I'll be back next week. All right. <laughs>